So the 2021 Academy Awards have passed and they were, as usual, a snooze fest. Literally, I fell asleep watching them. That may be because they start at 1am here in the UK, but God, it's hard to get through the awkward Hollywood BS. And this year was especially hard given the many stupid choices they made that continue to cause the ratings to nosedive. And you know why that is? Because no one gives a shit about the Oscars anymore. We all know that it's not a ceremony of what is actually the best, it's whatever production company gave out the most baskets for. And that is what I will be exposing today. Chloe Zhao swept the Oscars this year. Good for her and history as she is only the second female director to win an Oscar in over 90 years, leaving with one for directing and one for best picture for her third feature, Nomadland, a film that I personally don't think is that good nor did I find entertaining. I won't go deep into my thoughts on that film as that's not the point of this video, I'm not comparing the two. Simply put, it feels like the Academy only voted for that to win as the awards are not only produced by ABC which is owned by Disney who made Nomadland and the therefore could sway people to their side, but also given the fact that the film has an anti-capitalist message and therefore the incredibly wealthy voted for the film about poor people who have been beaten down by a system made to exploit them in order to look like they care and aren't completely out of touch. However, there is another film that was nominated that I believe deserves the so-called prestigious title of Best Picture far more. Promising Young Woman, written and directed by Emerald Fennell. She was able to snag the Best Original Screenplay Award, which is great, but I think it deserve to go beyond the this film has a good message but we don't like it enough to give it best picture award and that is for a multitude of reasons that I will go into. Chances are if you click this video you've already seen the film but if you haven't I'm gonna go into spoilers at several points so I highly recommend you skip this video until you see this bold fantastic work of art that will likely end up being a cult classic and remembered far more fondly of than Nomadland. Okay, so I'm actually going to talk about the film now and analyse what makes it such an outstanding film and why it's so deserving of that Best Picture title. Although marketed as one, this isn't a typical revenge thriller where the guy just goes and murders everyone wearing all black, i.e. female prisoner scorpion. There's a lot more depth to it. It's very subversive. Instead of just slicing and dicing, she psychologically breaks them down to make them realise their attitudes are wrong. And this all stems from Emerald Fennel's belief that she would much rather be shot than someone point out she's a bad person and explain why. Which is true. You get shot, you die. You get the Cassie treatment, you have to actually live with the fact that you're terrible and people know and then put in the effort to work on yourself. And I imagine this is far more cathartic for Cassie than just killing them because she is creating the change that she wants to see. It's only with Al who doesn't realise the error of his ways who she goes to inflict violence onto. It's also very subversive in terms of genre given how it plays with genre. This isn't strictly a thriller, it's also a dark comedy as well as a romance. And these tonal shifts never feel disconnected because they all flow well into each other and all feed off one another. It's the romance section of the film and how that's paced that makes the ending part much more thrilling due to the contrast while also never feeling jarringly black and white. The story is also delivered in such a refined and empathetic way by showing things that are also similar but shedding them in a different light that I feel like the people the film is calling out can actually take a look in the mirror after watching it and realise they're a bad person and want to change that. Fennel is actively creating the change that Cassie is also making. Both are methodical when it comes to their strategies. Obviously it won't change everyone's mind, but I feel like posts like these are made out of anger that the film called them out, but they just aren't ready to accept the literal rubbish that they are. Depending on who you are, you either consider this the best part of the film or the worst. It's surprisingly controversial. You always hear people say, main characters should die more often, and then when that actually happens they get pissed because it diverts from the same safe story beats they're used to, and now they actually have to think. That's not the only reason people hate it, some people think it's just there for shock value, while some think that it undermines the message of the film. And as much as I promote having your own opinion and how it's perfectly fine because art is subjective, I just can't see where these people are coming from. I think the film has serious balls for not only going through with the ending, but executing it excellently so that it actually elevates the message. First of all, it was absolutely shocking. I did not expect that to happen, and it feels like no one did. It sounds like such a bold move to kill off your main character with 20 minutes remaining of its runtime, but with how it assists the ideas it's presenting to the audience makes it undoubtedly the correct choice. There was a draft of the film where it ends on this shot, 
which didn't surprise me to hear, as when I watched it for the first time, I thought to myself that it would just cut to black right here and the credits would roll, leaving us with this haunting image and a message of how women can't win because society protects men. But it seems that was a bit too bleak, so she changed it to the ending we have today, which I think works a lot better. When it didn't cut to black, I was intrigued to see what would happen and was wondering if it would contrast the heinous killing we just saw with Al Monroe getting away with it to further reinforce that idea. But instead, we get a very stimulating ending that's a bit more hopeful and will never fail to make me smile. You see the initial text, the song starts to kick in, you hear the sirens, and you have this resounding, daunting sound effect of the fifth tally mark make a huge impact on the screen because that's how scared they are in that moment. And I just cherish it. This final ending shows that women can win, but at what cost? It demonstrates how it's so incredibly hard for them to win, and when they do, they have to lose something. In this case, her life. And there's discussion if you can even consider this a win for Cassie, because she died and she didn't even really get justice for Nina. Which I've seen a lot of people get riled up about, that the ending is stupid because Al doesn't go to jail for sexually assaulting Nina, but instead murdering Cassie. Which is, you know, the entire point of the film? That rape isn't punishable because men are protected by society due to patriarchal norms, so people, and that encompasses men, women, and a gender people, ignore it because they don't want to ruin a promising young man's life. And it highlights how many people actively facilitate rape by just being a bystander, for example, who doesn't speak up, further contributing to rape culture, which is sadly why between 2019 and 2020, in England and Wales, only 4% of reported rapes led to prosecutions. That's not the only thing about the ending that makes it so impressive though. And this is something I didn't even think of until listening to my favourite podcast boy, James Clement, after I watched it for the first time. The way I interpreted also her death was that, like, initially was like, this is like a suicide, you know what I mean? Like, she didn't really, this was her whole purpose, just to get revenge. Yeah, because she set up a whole lot of automated was, yeah. emails. Yeah, so, and exactly, like so this would all kind of unfold. And that's just brilliant. I've watched interviews where Emerald has said that she didn't write it that way, and doesn't believe Cassie committed suicide, but it's clear that she knew some people would interpret it like that, so she leaves little foreshadowing throughout the film with the use of biblical imagery. Literally, the first shot of Cassie is this, which is fairly self-explanatory, and it even goes on to be paralleled at the ending when she is killed. You could also say that this shot of Alfred Molina kneeling, begging for her forgiveness goes towards this as well, although I'm not entirely sure it is, it is a bit of a stretch. But then also this shot as well looks a lot like a halo, and the song that plays during this scene is literally called Blue Halo, as well as this shot seemingly giving her wings. All of this symbolism suggests that you could Just call me angel. I want to be more sensible in this video to come off as more respectable and intelligent, especially given the subject matter, but it's just fucking amazing. There's so much thought put into this. And I'm aware that this could be a coincidence and none of this was intentional because you'll be surprised the amount of times that is the case. But I don't think it is. All signs point to it being deliberately placed. And from watching hours of interviews, Emerald Fennel comes off as such a perceptive person that I think she knew how to sow the seeds to allow Cassie's death to be interpreted as a great sacrifice so Nina can finally get justice. Or you could interpret it as just a plain suicide because of how depressed she is and how she feels like she's not living for anything anymore. More. Because the very final end credits song sounds very hopeful and it hints that she is now at peace. And that is marvellous, that we can all think different things about it. I personally think that she didn't intend to kill herself and she just set these swings in motion in case things went south, because although regret is a thing and I'm sure there's an element of, you know, instinct with this, she is clearly fighting to stay alive. She doesn't want to die in that moment, but sadly, a man comes out on top once again. Or does he? Obviously, the biggest social commentary it makes, I just said, so I won't repeat myself, but damn, there is a lot of it, and it is so good. I don't like that this film seems to be written off as a Me Too movement film by a lot of people. Okay, hold on. I know a lot of you most probably just winced at me saying that because I sound like a typical uh, Reddit incel type, but that is not me at all. It's just hard to articulate what I'm about to say without sounding like a it's PC gone bloody mad. Keep your politics out of my video games type of person. But pretty much what I'm about to say is how companies are desperately trying to prove 
that they're woke instead of just actually being woke. So yeah, I just wanted to clarify that so I don't come off as uh, a dickhead. Because to me, one of those is a film that was only made after that abhorrent creature was finally taken down and male executives who were most probably buddies with him scrambled to make the most basic film ever about what they think is empowering to women in order to not look like they are the scum of the earth implying that it's only made because feminism is mainstream now, instead of the fact that it's a story that needs to be told and a message that needs to be heard. Thankfully, the industry is opening up. It only took a fucking century, but there's still a long way to go, given how the bigger films feature overly comical and unsubtle misogyny and perfect women so nothing ever feels earned or interesting. This, however, is not one of those. In fact, this film displays internalized misogyny within women, which I am very thankful for because it's a problem that doesn't get talked about enough because people just think oh she is woman she can't be misogynistic and it's the same with queer people it's such a big issue but most people don't even recognize it because of how we're brought up in a society that's against these things anyway this is displayed through madison and dean walker both people who did not take nina's accusation seriously for two different reasons Madison didn't believe Nina due to her sexual history, therefore slut shaming, and Dean Walker didn't do anything about it because there's a chance she could be lying and she doesn't want to ruin a man's career over that, and this is called Empathy, a relatively new term coined by writer Kate Mann. And also, only around 5% of reported rapes end up being false accusations. And the real figure is likely a lot lower given how there have been cases where people are just berated and interrogated endlessly that they just say they lied to make the whole situation be over. So it's ridiculous that she would side with that very small minority. Going back to Madison for a sec, she also has internalized misogyny because it sounds like she's very submissive to her husband. All guys want the same thing. A good girl. But also when Cassie says that she doesn't have kids, she replies, you'll get there. And that's commenting on the heteronormative belief that women exist to give birth to kids as if that's their destiny and one true purpose. And women who don't are never respected as much for some reason, as if this makes them a bad woman because they aren't a real one because they don't conform to this notion. Now back to the Dean, she doesn't even remember Nina's name, which at first is shocking because sexual assault is such an awful thing, you would think that you would remember it. But it happens way too fucking much. It shouldn't happen at all, but the fact that it's this common is so disheartening. In the country that I hate is my home, 97% of women aged between 18 to 24 have been sexually harassed. And 80% of all women have been sexually harassed. And that's just what's been reported. I also feel this could be commenting on the fact that women in history have always been forgotten about and how men always get the credit and how people always downplay women's achievements and belittle their experiences. In the same scene, Cassie says, Who needs brains? They never did a girl any good. And this is definitely a commentary on how people hate smart women. There have been several studies showing how men are less attracted to smart women, most probably because they see them as a threat as their fragile masculinity can't handle that. But also there's a fair share of that hatred coming from women as well, because I assume they're envious of how they've been able to break from the mold and the norm that Women dumb. Later on, the incel says, You're not even that hot. Which I'm not really sure why this is a thing people say, but I'm pretty sure it comes from denoting a woman's worth from their appearance and how he's trying to prove that he doesn't consider this a loss by saying that. Like, if she was psycho but super sexy, he would have gone through with it. And he also says, Why do you guys have to ruin everything? Which illustrates the idea that feminism is bad because it makes men's life harder. When, no. It doesn't. They're just entitled and now they can't get away with being manipulative trash anymore. In the scene with Alfred Molina, Cassie instinctively flinches when he gets close to her and just like those statistics I brought up, this shows how common sexual harassment is because she's most probably used to men grabbing her without consent and trying to do something. At the ending, there's a lot of similar dialogue that's all making the same comment about the belief that women are objects, so I'll just play all those clips now. Order. Solid catch. Then Al Monroe says that he's a gentleman and Cassie responds with, You might be surprised to hear that gentlemen are sometimes the worst. Which I really like how this highlights how gentleman is literally just the old fashioned term for nice guy. Al then says, I don't want to sound like a pussy, but you're not, you're not going to do anything, are you? Fellas, 
Is it gay to be concerned about your safety and well-being? Yeah, I love how people give women so much shit for caring about how they look, which first of all is only because of patriarchal norms that were created by other men. While men care so fucking much about their image and how they're perceived due to toxic masculinity. The last thing they want to be seen as is feminine, so they conform to the heteronormative idea that men are strong and cool. And a great one is when Al is suffocating Cassie and says, This is your fucking fault! Clearly relating to the huge victim blaming surrounding sexual assaults. Society has made it women's problem for wearing revealing clothing, as if it's their fault for being raped because some cleavage was showing, but not the men's for not being able to resist their urges, which they shouldn't even have in the first place. These women get blamed for showing skin, which is absolutely ridiculous because it's not their fault society sexualized their bodies from the moment they were born. Women have tits! They're just there! What, what, where do you expect them to go when they decide to go out in public? You wanna just slice them off every time? They shouldn't have to hide them. The morning after, Joe walks in and says, Hey, time for you to go. Yeah, this is a thing where people just call women they don't even know, and typically women in service, like waiters, honey and sweetheart, which is just weird and so condescending. And then the touching. It's just gross. Obviously there are situations where not to take this into action, but just ask for consent. And side note, just because they gave consent for one occasion doesn't mean a yes for all future occasions. And all this links back to the idea that women are objects, which is why he doesn't respect her enough to not do it, and most probably assumes that because she's a stripper, she doesn't mind being touched. That's all the social commentary examples I will talk about now, but the reason why it's so great is because it's so subtle. These lines of dialogue are things we hear all the time, but because of the context of the film, it highlights how damaging it actually is and makes the audience realize that, allowing them to be better people. The aesthetic of this film is eye-popping. I hate this word because pretentious critics just use it as a buzzword to sound smart, but the candy-coated mise-en-scene works so well in contrast with the themes of the film. Most notably, Cassie's outfits. This is so good on two, technically three, that, that's still two. You're a fucking idiot. This is so good on two, technically three levels. Firstly, the fact that these colourful feminine outfits, and that includes the nails, don't match how she feels on the inside, and the fact that because she wears these outfits, people don't expect her to be capable of what she does. She's hiding in plain sight. And it also shows how people don't take feminine stuff seriously. Secondly, the colourful nature of her outfits have fairly childish connotations. We relate vibrance to childhood innocence, and also the bows she wears in her hair is quite a typical schoolgirl look. This isn't highlighting that she's like a child because she's immature, I think it's supposed to convey how she's stuck in time because she can't move on from Nina, so all she's thinking about is the past. Nina's mum literally says to her, Don't be a child, Cassie. While she is drinking from a juice carton, which is huge school lunchbox iconography because everyone was guzzling those left and right growing up. And also in this scene with Madison, she seems disgusted in Cassie's house and looks very judgmental. And that's because of the retro old timey look it has. And I think this is supposed to show how not only is Cassie stuck in the past, but so are her parents because they are so worried about her. And this illustrates how sexual assault doesn't just affect the victim, but their family and friends and the family and friends of those people as well. Accentuating how utterly devastating and awful it is. But also I'm aware that her parents might just like this look, but it just all adds up there's no way this wasn't done consciously. Furthermore, her notebook. I wonder if the different colour pens actually mean something or if it's just Cassie being colourful because it looks nice. It's interesting to think that maybe those red ones are when things went wrong, whether she just messed up, ended up getting hurt, or ended up hurting them. And also while I'm here, the floral bed sheets. Not only pink, but flowers are seen as very feminine and just further adds to the whole idea. Oh, and how could I forget the fedora? Top notch. The film was shot on anamorphic lenses after DP Benjamin Cracoon suggested doing so. And if you don't know what that is, pretty much, if you're on a smaller focal length, it will give a sort of fisheye distortion, and with blurred backgrounds, it gives this spinny radial distortion, which I've always just liked the look of, but the use of these lenses also adds to the whole dreamy fairy tale like aesthetic I spoke about earlier. Actually, talking about the shots in the film, they're great and work in tandem with the editing extremely well. There's no surprise that Frederick Thorival was nominated 
nominated for Best Video Editing. It's so clean. There are some terrific transitions in this film but really help with the film's almost perfect pacing, such as this match cut of Cassie eating, but instead of being a direct match shot, the camera is pulled out more in order to establish the new location so we aren't disorientated. The next day, the lingering of this close-up of Carrie's deadpan face makes the joke a lot funnier because the choice to not cut away quickly makes it more awkward. Then this series of shots where the camera continually zooms between cuts. I've just always liked this, and it's typically used to build tension, which this film does do in other scenes, and I like that for this, I feel it could represent Cassie's and ultimately her parents' excitement that she is actually going out and doing something. Another zooming shot I like, which I'm pretty sure is actually a dolly outward, is this, and how it cuts suddenly during Madison's voicemail to indicate how Cassie doesn't care about her. And something that particularly piqued my interest on my initial watch was the motif of panning up, I know the technical term is actually a pedestal shot or a jib, be quiet, from her back up to her head. At first I thought this could be an intertextual reference to the male gaze, especially as it does that typical shot at the beginning, but on a rewatch after noticing other things that I mentioned earlier, I think this is another way of telling us how she is stuck on her past as the camera is behind her and she is struggling to move forward. And also could be alluding to how she left school behind her to support Nina. There's also a fair share to talk about regarding the cinematography and editing with the ending, or should I say, lack of editing. Cassie's death being a two minute long one take as the camera slowly and creepily floats over to Al Monroe's face makes it that much more crushing. It shows how grueling it is and it makes it more realistic because that's how long it takes to smother someone. It isn't just 10 seconds of strangling. And the whole two minutes we just sit there thinking that she's gotta find a way out and overpower him. So when she doesn't after all that time, it makes it so much more distressing. And then it cuts to a bird's eye view shot, like it's mimicking a sex scene, another trademark of the male gaze. And then the morning after is insane. My jaw is on the floor watching this for the first time. This scene could literally be ripped from the opening of a generic shitty early 2000s comedy, but the shot composition is so off kilter that it's alarming. Another pretty big thing as well is the ironic use of Steadicam. I won't lie, I didn't pick this up, I just heard Fennel say it in an interview, but Steadicam is only used when Cassie is losing control, and I find that kind of funny. <laughs> The original score composed for the film by Anthony Willis is alright, you know, it's effective at complementing the scenes and adding more weight to them, although I feel there are some times where it wasn't entirely necessary, but it's just quite uninspired. I feel I've heard all of these songs before. still noteworthy, especially with how his pensive arrangements were never able to feel jarring alongside the licensed pop soundtrack, which I love. When I sat down to watch the film for the first time, although I had been so excited to watch it for the past 15 months, I was worried that it wouldn't be able to live up to that. And then I started it, and that concern kind of disappeared as this song started to play. I was busy thinking about boys. I had never even heard that song before, but I just really liked it, and it sets the tone of the film perfectly, and you immediately know the type of film you're about to watch. And once the logo stop, we get these shots that completely dissipated any of that doubt I had. These shots subvert the male gaze, as typically with an upbeat song like this, you would have shots of women in bikinis dancing, and I love how Fennel reversed that right out of the bag. And unlike it would be with women, she's not trying to balance out the over-sexualization. This isn't sexual. If anything, it's the opposite. It, it's quite sad. And if I do the reverse and talk about the closing credits, I really like the song Last Laugh by Fletcher and it's a very fitting closing song for obvious reasons. The soundtrack's just really good and it also links back to what I said earlier about costume. People don't take pop songs seriously because the biggest demographic of it are teenage girls and therefore not considered real music, because for some reason, everyone hates what teenage girls love. In addition, Fennel has expressed her love for the song, but I feel there's more significance to using Paris Hilton's Stars Are Blind like all of the other songs. There's gotta be some message here about how her career was kind of destroyed from that sex tape being leaked because the media just vilified her for doing something that the majority of the population do in the comfort of their home just because she's a woman. Also, everyone keeps talking about it, so I feel if I don't mention it, someone will get 
get angry, but the Toxic cover by Willis, it's really creepy, especially because it's a song we've all heard, but we can tell there's something slightly off about it. It's like the Uncanny Valley, but for sound instead of visuals. <laughs> I already spoke about how the dialogue is imbued with social commentary and never feels shoehorned in, so I won't repeat that, but the rest of the film's dialogue is pretty good as well. There's only one occasion where I thought it sounded unnatural, and it's this. Cassie. Don't Cassie me, I'm fine. Gail, really. It's so rare when you talk to your friends that you actually say their name, which is why it sticks out like a sore thumb when films do this in their first act so we know everyone's name, which isn't even necessary for telling the story. But given how I already majorly spoke about the dialogue, the main reason I made this section is because I want to bring to your attention a line that was in the final shooting draw, but thankfully didn't make it into the final film. The first scene with Ryan originally went a little differently. Instead of responding like this, You didn't mean... What am I doing working in a shitty coffee shop? Cassie originally said this. And whoever made the decision for that to not be in the film, thank you. Because uh, I maybe would not be making this video if that was the case. It just always takes you out when a character says the title of the film, and it's rarely done well. And also, it comes off as quite narcissistic, and I feel that doesn't really match Cassie's personality that much. Cassie is such an interesting character to talk about. She sparks hours of discussion given how many people would see her in a different light. Some people think she's a straight up whack job, some people think everything she does is completely justified, and then there are people in the middle. And not only that, but due to Carey Mulligan's authoritative performance, she brings the character to life and allows us to read her and combined with Fennel's direction creates a fascinating character to watch because although her character's motives, goals, and main personality traits are given to us heavily, there's still room for subtle nuance so the audience interpret what she does differently while everyone still has the same basic idea. And this is what shocked me to believe that Carrie didn't nab the stupid Best Actress award. I love Frances McDormand, but the range Mulligan shows here is exponential and there's just a lot more going on with the character to make her more compelling to me. I just really like Cassie. I think she's, ironically, a very genuine person. Like I said previously, I like her style. I also align with her views, so I find it very satisfying to watch her make these crappy people crumble and I like her cynical sense of humour. I just really identify with her whole manner and expression. You know, like the ironic joke about her saying Ryan is boring but rich. It's very much a joke I would make as it takes the piss out of the stereotype that all women are gold diggers. However, while I do admire committing to a joke, spitting in someone's coffee is a bit too far. She also just sticks her gum under the Dean's desk, which is a bit of a dick move, but this also relates back to what I said about the childish costume, because bubblegum is fairly typical schoolgirl imagery as well for some reason. And I don't think the Dean, in that moment at least, is actually completely sorry. She just tells Cassie what she wants to hear to make the whole ordeal be over. And I think, looking at her face, Cassie is aware of this, but doesn't want to go through the extra effort as it feels like she isn't getting any joy from all this revenge anymore, which is evident from the following scene where she smashes that piece of shit's car up, and at first it makes her feel righteous, but then she realises she's consumed by this harrowing want for revenge that it's turning her into a worse person, and I think she's starts to kind of notice that but doesn't want to come to terms with it. She knows she's depressed but doesn't want to seek actual help because that means confronting it. Which, in a way, is similar to Al Monroe because I feel like deep down he knows he's a horrible rapist but doesn't want to admit it because, as we all know, if you lie enough, eventually it becomes the truth. Furthermore, I really want to credit her acting acting. You know in films and TV when a character is acting and even though they have had no acting experience, they are just immaculate because instead of acting like some Someone who can't act trying to act, they are just performing as that? That's a pet peeve of mine, so I appreciate that in this it's realistic and you can actually see Carrie acting as Cassie acting. And even if it was perfect, you could defend it by saying she's been doing it for six years. She would have gotten good by it now, but it's not. When she sees Ryan walking out of that bar, she immediately snaps out of it. Chances are that's not the only time she's come out of character without realizing. And also the first scene with Madison. You can see Cassie underneath this whole facade she's putting on, almost as if she's lost laughing at Madison the whole time, relishing in what she's about to do to her. You can tell she kind of plays the whole thing up with the way she composes herself, whether it's her posture, her facial expressions, or the sly line delivery. It's clear she's playing a caricature instead of just that character. So well done, Carrie and Fennel, for actually putting effort in and not doing this thing that always annoys me and takes me out of the media I consume. <laughs>
This is something that I didn't even notice until after watching the film, as depending on the film and who it is, I'm able to accept them as a different person, but the casting of this film is really well thought out. Fennel and her casting directors, Lindsay Graham, Mary Vernu, with assistance from Carrie Martin and Patty Reinhardt, did a brilliant job at weaponizing the cast in order to add to the film's message. The cast is mostly comprised of comedic actors, actors we've all grown to love. Bo Burnham, who just seems like a delightful guy to be around, and wrote and directed a very truthful scene about sexual harassment in his feature debut. Adam Brody, who's always seen as the nice, charming guy in both real life and most of the stuff he's worked on. Alison Brie, who's most known for being the somewhat goody two-shoes in Community. Connie Britton, who's known for being typically very responsible and motherly. Christopher Mintz Plass, who played McLovin in Superbad, who seems like the most vulnerable person ever. As well as the guy from New Girl, which I saw maybe two episodes of nine years ago, so I can't exactly comment on that. Why this is so smart is because the most moment we see them, you're supposed to feel this sense of comfort from them and you instinctively side with them, making you feel horrible once it's revealed they are bad people. This shows how everyone is part of the problem and it can be the people you least expect. It's telling us to reflect on ourselves so we don't make assumptions about someone because of how they look or the little we have heard or seen of them. Everyone's hiding something and sometimes it's hidden with an attractive face and likeable charm. I feel this is most effective with the casting of Chris Lowell another amicable alumni from GLOW. From the moment we hear Al Monroe's name, we instantly build up this threatening image of him from Cassie's reaction. And then, after all that build up, it turns out to be a cute, kinda chubby guy who looks like he couldn't hurt a fly, reinforcing how a sex offender could be literally anyone. It's not the stereotypical rip dude or really creepy looking dude, it's just this guy. And he even clearly loves his wife and is very loyal to her, but that doesn't mean there's not a dark side to him. And and ironically, it's the reverse with Alfred Molina and Clancy Brown. Clancy Brown is most known for playing antagonistic characters, and in this, he's like arguably the loveliest person in the film, and Alfred Molina, most known for being Doc Ock in Spider-Man 2, is the only person in the film who ends up showing true guilt for what he's done, and is fully aware that he's a terrible person. And from the moment we see him, we're scared. He's a big dude with a rough beard, yet he ends up being the only person Cassie can wholeheartedly forgive. And that's why we're sort of playing a against type here is so intelligent. And although this didn't really work for me apart from Alfred Molina's character, it's still something I can hugely appreciate as a lot of effort was put into it and filmmakers never seem to realize how impactful casting can be to the story and its ideas. So good on the most underappreciated people working in the film industry, casting directors, as well as Emerald Fennel for working together to get the cast members be their ammunition. And it goes without saying, but so there's no confusion, they're all great. Their performances are all great. Right. I feel it's unfair to ignore the negatives, so the biggest problem I have with the film, and the only significant one, is the character of Ryan and how the film is structured around him to an extent. I think the part of the film that turns into a cheesy rom-com, although well done in terms of remaining tonally consistent, ends up feeling unnecessary and like a waste of my time given how blatantly obvious it is that Ryan will end up being a bad guy and have something to do with Nina's sexual assault. That twist is possibly the least surprised I've ever felt. Okay, I'm being a bit hyperbolic. Fennel does a great job at making me feel sorry for Cassie in the moment, but not at shocking you. With any good twist, there will be subtle foreshadowing throughout the film that one would catch on a rewatch, but she doesn't do that very well. It's very clear that she's not the best guy around. I applaud that she attempted to hint that he's not all that, the hit Nickelodeon TV show, and I'm also aware that I may be in the minority, but it just doesn't stick the landing. The first time we see him, he immediately asks Cassie out on a date, even though they don't have much of a connection, which I thought was a bit of a red flag, as he likely only asked as he finds her physically attractive. After Cassie declines by giving him a fake number, he comes back to the store and demands that she goes on a date with him. If someone says no, they mean no. Don't continue to pursue them, that is really creepy. It's clear that his ego can't handle rejection because his toxic masculinity is confused as to why she wouldn't go out with him. Then, at the end of their first date, he insinuates that they go up to his apartment and bang, which is quite a shallow thing to do, and it's like he believes that because he took her out to dinner, he should get sex 
peace in return. And yes, I know in the moment he takes it back and realizes it was too soon, but I personally read that as him only saying that because he also realizes that this puts him a step away from getting what he wants and therefore only says it to sound like he's a good guy, which is supported later on in the film when he shows his true colors once Cassie shows him the tape. More on that in a sec. The next sketchy thing he does which made me completely write him off is showing up to Cassie's work and then her home after she doesn't message him back. Oh, but he was being a caring boyfriend and was paranoid. Fuck off. I message people and sometimes they don't get back to me for a whole day. And I just assume they're busy or don't want to talk and I respect that. I don't stalk them by going to their place of work and then their house. All of this behavior comes off as progressively creepy. It seems like he's possessive of Cassie and is annoyed that she isn't submissive. This is further demonstrated later on when Madison does the same thing after Cassie doesn't return any of her calls but she actually acknowledges she is acting crazily. I know, it seems kind of crazy me waiting on your porch like some a stalker or something. Madison. And she's aware that she's acting like a stalker because chances are she's most probably had men do it to her after rejecting them and hated it and therefore knows what it's like and wants to make that clear to Cassie. Then you can defend Ryan with the scene where the incel says, My bad dude, I didn't know the woman was taken, but yeah, she's all yours, man. All my. He reacts like he's disgusted in this man for talking about Cassie like she is an object made only for sex. And I think Fennel wrote this in as a curveball to keep the audience thinking if he's actually good or not. But it doesn't work like that. The bar is just so low for men that people consider not being a misogynist a good thing. When no, that should be the fucking standard. Knowing women aren't sex objects doesn't make you a good person. It makes you a run-of-the-mill, decent human being. When trying to rekindle their relationship, he says, You won't kiss me or touch me, which is fine. And I feel like just like earlier, he adds that which is fine in order to make it seem like he's not just trying to get sexual pleasure from her. After the dinner scene, Ryan just calls her a stupid bitch, which... I mean, it's gotta be ironic, right? But the line delivery of it doesn't sound like that, but we know it is given the context. Which I actually really appreciate that Fennel directed Bo to say the line in such a way where we can't really tell. Either way, when he says this, it's just a massive shock to everyone, and even if he is saying it playfully, it's still not a very good joke, possibly hinting towards his inner sodge, which comes out once Cassie shows the tape to him. Ryan doesn't even apologize. He just expects Cassie to forgive him. You gotta forgive me. Tell me to forgive me. And turns the whole thing into her problem for not being able to do so. Causing him to get defensive and go from saying I love you to You fucking failure. In mere seconds. And this is very reminiscent of how men will hit on a woman and when they reject them, their whole demeanor changes and respond by calling them a bitch or a slut. Because, okay, now not sleeping with someone makes you a slut? Okay. And it's also another subtle reference to what I was saying earlier about how society has made sexual assault women problem. And also just before this, he tries to defend him being in the video by saying, I was a kid. Which is a very stupid and common defense because first of all, he was around 20, so not a kid. And when I was half that age, I knew rape was bad. So there's no excuse as to why he didn't. And he did know it was bad, but he knew that he could get away with being a cohort given the state of the world. So yeah, although Fennel continues to give wonderfully sewn in social commentary, which I admire her for, she doesn't do a good job of subtly foreshadowing a twist as it was far too on the nose for me. And this isn't me trying to be like, oh, well, I guess I'm just better at watching films than you because I've seen so many and I saw this coming from a mile away, you idiot. <laughs> this was just my actual reaction to watching the film for the first time. Because I know some people will actually think this is genius and very subtle, but I don't think it is. We've just grown up in a society where the media is dominated by straight cis men, so we see a lot of films where this type of behaviour is normalised, and so we don't see it as bad when it is. Anyway, I was just shocked to come out of the film and see people like the whole bit with Ryan, as while I was watching it, I thought to myself, ah, so this is the part everyone universally agrees brings the film down. And I do like that bit on a second watch as I can appreciate the genre subversion, but on my first watch it just felt like a waste of my time and therefore a hindrance to the structure and its pacing. I'm aware that section of the film is supposed to show Cassie gaining hope after being depressed for so long to add impact to the reveal, but I just don't buy it. I don't believe Cassie actually likes him and Fennel has said that their connection is this is true love. But if that's the case, she should have done a better job at showing that, because I personally feel like Cassie doesn't actually like Ryan, she just uses him as a tether because she's been lost for so long. 
and by that I mean he's a distraction. It's light outside now. I'm rec oh my, it's 6 a.m. Oh my fucking god, it's 6 a.m. <laughs> I'm just gonna come back another day and record the rest. I'm I'm sorry. <laughs> And I'm back on a different day and in a different room with different hair and a different microphone which isn't as good quality but it's fine because I want this to be a very casual part of the video as it's unscripted and I'm just going to be listing off some of the notes I wrote down when I rewatched the film but didn't include in any other sections for reasons. So uh, let's, let's get into it. Uh, the first one. Uh, remember to pick up your little brother for- Oh fuck! Yeah, I'm really funny. The first main thing I left out is, um, you know the scene with Neil, uh, McLovin, and he says- he says something like this. Why are you wearing all that makeup? Do you mind me asking? I never understood why women wear so much makeup. It's like, you guys are so much more beautiful without it. It's like, guys don't even like that kind of stuff, you know? It's just this soul-sucking system meant to oppress women. It is fucked up. Which, yes, to an extent, is true. Makeup does oppress women. All of the biggest makeup companies are run by men who feed off the insecurities of women that have been, you know, put in place from patriarchal norms and deep-rooted misogyny. But also, at the same time, you hear men say this a lot, like, Oh, you know, you look so much nicer with your makeup. Stop wearing your fucking makeup. But at the same time, I don't fucking care. They can look how they want to look, but everything they do isn't for the pleasure of a man. This all just stems from the belief that women exist to be fucked by men, and therefore everything they do is, is for a man. Pe people wear makeup for themselves. You know, it's the exact same reason why I bleach and dye my hair. I think it looks nice. It's not, it's not because I want people to fuck me, you know? So it's the exact same thing. Cassie's just wearing that makeup, well, actually i think she's putting on a character in, in that scene but people in general just wear makeup because it looks nice and they like the look you know like the best example of this is like euphoria like just look at all the makeup in that show that's just so creative and expressive that's just a oh, fucking sick it just looks so cool but of course also then there is the makeup where it's like you're wearing that because you feel uncomfortable with how you look and you're only wearing it because society says that you need to look beautiful and sexy and you think makeup will help you achieve that because otherwise if you're ugly you have no worth as a woman um what else ah yes uh when uh i got this note um when clancy brown he says something like this we really miss her but god we have missed you that for some it just always gets me there's something about the delivery of it that is just like so sad but then so like Re reassuring as well and it just it just really gets me and i really like that line and it's really well delivered right here i just got uh women are silenced what a great in-depth note ah yeah um so the scene when like the detective comes into ryan's office and he's like oh thanks for all your work for the community or whatever I'll, I'll just play the clip thank you for all that you do for the community sure that bit with Ryan, the way he says, sure. It's like he knows that the detective doesn't mean that, he's just saying that so the detective looks like he's a nice person who doesn't just dismiss a, a doctor who saves the lives of children. Which, you know, I did write down and it is an interesting social commentary even if I'm just reading in, be in between the lines and it wasn't there and Emerald didn't write that in the film as this. But you know, I just, I feel like that's very like, you know, it's like a social commentary on the artificial chatter and kindness that we all do in the form of small talk. But Detective doesn't mean that, he just says it to sound like he's a good person to help his image. And then Ryan just says, sure, to not threaten his, the image that he is presenting. Presenting and just be nice and go along with the whole idea of this small talk because he knows he's bullshitting. You know, it's like that whole thing where it's like, and I fucking hate this, when people say, how are you, as a greeting. And they don't care how you are, they just mean it as, hello. It's like, don't say, how are you, if you don't want an actual fucking answer, you just want me to say yes, and fuck off. Stop saying how are you to make it look like you actually care about me. Just say hello. And I feel like, you know, even if that wasn't intentional, that's what I personally got from it, because I overanalyze uh, everything, because it's pretentious film nerd <laughs> <coughs> fuck anyway what was this uh, video about what else have i got uh yeah i think that might be it if there's anything else that i've forgotten i will put it here right now
Wow, how could I forget that? Damn, that's really crazy. I can't believe I forgot that as well. I forgot that? Wow, that's crazy. Um, anyway, chances are most people skipped over this section, uh, which I don't blame them, because this is why I write my stuff beforehand. I am a terrible improviser. Um, but anyway, now enjoy my rendition of the Maro and Loogie, uh, Ma the Maro and Loogie, uh, theme song. Uh, here we go, it goes something like this. I don't like that sound. Yeah, and then if I just cut. Okay, and I'm back in this room on yet another day, and this time I'm actually in focus. So, uh, yeah. Okay, wow. Um, I never wanted to be that guy who makes a super long serious review on just one film, because why would I watch the film when I can watch a review that's twice as long? Duh. But it really is just that good, in my opinion. And I want people to know that. I want to express my love for this film. This film just makes me so happy, and that is very rare nowadays, but I actually derive joy from anything, even films that I'm excited for. But Promising Young Woman is a very good film. It makes me so joyful. And honestly, some of that trickled down into making this video, and I hope also transferred into you watching it, whether it opened your eyes, or you just wanted to hear someone with similar thoughts validate yours. Or you don't like the film and you just liked laughing at me. Or you do like the film and you still laughed at me. <laughs> now, finding a way to actually link it back to the point of the video, these are all the key reasons as to why Promising Young Woman should have got Best Picture at the 2021 Academy Awards. But it didn't. And that's okay, because Oscars are meaningless. That was the title for my Year 10 Spoken English Language exam presentation and I got the highest grade possible. Obviously they give the film and crew members more recognition, but beyond that, there really is no value to getting one of those statues. There's no achievement. It's stupid. Most of the Academy consists of old, white, straight cis men who have ulterior motives when voting for the films, if they even actually watched them. Because my personal number one of 2020 wasn't even nominated for anything, which I wasn't necessarily surprised by given how early in the year it came out and how it's just a bunch of no names which shouldn't even matter but I was still shocked that Talia Ryder didn't even get a best supporting actor nomination at least like come on are you serious and I'm sure a few of you are a bit taken aback by how Promising Young Woman isn't my favorite film of 2020 given how I've fawned over it extensively but there's a real fine line of my rewatching habits as I don't like rewatching stuff so quickly because returns always diminish hence why I haven't talked about that but Promising Young Woman sits right on that line because it sparks so much discussion that it's so rewatchable. On top of the fact that it is a dark comedy, so it is very entertaining. Promising Young Woman is so fulfilling to watch for me, and I think it deserves Best Picture for that reason alone. We will be talking about this film for far longer than Nomadland, and I feel this film reflects the time more accurately and will have a much bigger impact on pop culture given how subversive it is and its style. I really applaud that Emerald Fennel approached this film with descriptivism instead of being like, Nope! This is how I thought about it! This is what's happening! because a lot of directors do that and they are assholes. So not only is Emerald Fennel not an asshole, she is a very promising... <laughs> she is a very promising young filmmaker. You thought I was going to say woman. I was originally, but then I thought that that would be just as corny as the line of dialogue <laughs> that I spoke about earlier. So yeah, I'm not doing that. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is the part where like, usually I end the video. Sorry, my clothes can't keep the hands from If you sat through that entire thing, uh, wow, just thank you so much. Uh, this really took an insanely long amount of time to put this whole thing together. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it's perfect. So if I got anything factually incorrect, please inform me so that I can be the best that I can be. And now I'm going to go Google mountain landscape sunset and paste what I just said <laughs> onto it and then post it to my inspirational quote Instagram page. And, uh, yeah, no, I don't know, do whatever you want. Just don't harm people, please. 
Unless... <laughs> no, I shouldn't say that.